Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Wojciech Macek. I work in SemiHealth. And for the last two years, on behalf of Kavium, I was leading the project uh, which was meant to provide the Kavium ThunderX support to the FreeBSD operating system. Uh, today, I'm going to tell a little about the up and downs of the project and try to familiarize you all uh, with the internals of ThunderX system on chip. Uh, at the beginning, I'd like to talk a little about what is the ARM64, why is it better than it was uh, the previous architectures, and then I will describe uh, details about work which was done both uh, from Foundation and from B and uh, by SemiHealth. Uh, and for the first time, uh, finally, we are able to provide you with some performance measurements which we, which we had uh, taken in the last uh, one month. So, what's it all about with 64-bit with, uh, ARM? Why is it so better? Well, uh, the answer is quite obvious. Uh, the new architecture uh, provides us with uh, up to 64 bits of virtual address space. Uh, it also mm, gives ability to use up to 48 bits of physical system memory. If I counted correctly, that means we've got 25, 6 terabytes of RAM, which can be connected to the uh, ARM processor, which will probably be enough over the few decades. So it was quite a huge improvement comparing to the previous ARM v7 architecture. Uh, the other thing that has changed, uh, for th those of you familiar with ARM v7, uh, the ARM v7 had uh, only I believe 12 or something uh, system registers available per user. Uh, right now, we've got uh, 30 registers, uh, plus uh, some special ones like link register, stack pointer, program counter, and the very special uh, XZR, which is equivalent to dev0 in FreeBSD. Uh, so that changed. Also, uh, well, sorry, uh, wrong slide. Uh, that change uh, let the compiler and let the assembler uh, be more efficient. Uh, if we have a lot more registers which are tightly coupled to the CPU, uh, then the code which we are executing probably it executes faster. Uh, also, the main disadvantages of ARM v7 was its limitation about core numbers. Uh, for all those of you familiar with big little architecture, uh, there was a maximum eight CPUs which were allowed on the single uh, CPU, single core in chip. Uh, the limitation was mostly because of uh, the uh, register which described interrupt affinity was three bit size, so uh, it was actually able to address eight CPUs. Uh, right now, uh, using the fact that ARM already had to develop the new, completely new architecture, they decided to increase the total number of CPUs uh, supported in the single chip to 96 cores. So it's quite a huge improvement, uh, especially uh, that because ARM64 is uh, meant to be run on some server applications. So the more cores you have, the more performance can you get from the single chip. Um, but there is something more that meets the eye. Uh, the ARM64 is meant to be a direct competitor for Intel. Uh, so um, a lot of work has been done uh, to, uh, I would say, uh, make it very similar to what the Intel offers. Uh, right now, we have a completely new set of instructions. It's called AR64. Uh, we also have a very clear exception level design. Uh, we no longer have banked registers, uh, some stack switches, etc. We have clear four uh, exception levels for the whole system. Exception level, the lowest one, zero, is responsible for user space application. Uh, the first uh, is responsible for kernel. Above this, we have a hypervisor. And on the very top, we've got a secure, uh, secure firmware, which can be run on, on ARM. Uh, there was also a lot of cleanup done uh, with the features the core supports. Uh, right now, uh, the core is able to do some cryptographic stuff and also has a mandatory uh, floating point operation and NEON, which was optional in previous architectures. Um, from the standardization perspective, we also have uh, some components like SMMU and PSCI. Uh, PSCI is the most, in most interesting part uh, because it's responsible for starting the companion cores in SMP systems. 
uh, previous in previous architectures, every vendor created its own uh, method of powering up cores. Uh, so it was complete mess. Everything was not compatible. We have a lot of drivers different. And now we've got PSCI, which is meant to be the right way uh, to power up all the cores we've got in the system. Uh, engineers from ARM also provided the co full compatibility with the previous uh, code compiled for ARM v7. Uh, on ARM 64, uh, you can work in legacy mode and uh, run all the images uh, which were meant to be run on MV7. It's probably uh, why the uh, first Linux was run on Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it was done in 32-bit uh, mode. Uh, so that's uh, proof uh, that it actually works. So as you see, it's really similar to what Intel offers nowadays. So uh, let's go back two years ago. Uh, two years ago, there was uh, ARMv8 was not a very popular architecture at all. Uh, the Kavium was the first uh, company which decided to implement uh, the server chip uh, which incorporates ARMv8 cores. Uh, the main competitor was, it was meant to be a main, main competitor for Intel architectures, so a lot of work was done to make this chip efficient. Uh, even looking at the specification, we can see uh, that there's quite a decent chip. Uh, it has 48 cores, uh, ARMv8. Uh, it's fully coherent, it offers virtualization and uh, PCI 3.0 and all, all such stuff which is required in several applications. Uh, it also can accommodate up to one terabyte of RAM. It also implies it's uh, very suitable uh, for use in all kinds of data centers. Uh, what's more, uh, the single chip also incorporates a very decent uh, network adapter. Uh, the chip provided uh, by Kavium are able to provide uh, two 40 gig interfaces inside the chip. So uh, when you buy this, you no longer have to buy any other network adapter. You can just use uh, what's inside the SOC. Uh, it also provides some other IOs like SATA, like USB 3.0, just like any other PC uh, which, we, which we see nowadays. This was the board uh, we started the development with. Uh, the picture doesn't show how big is it. Uh, between one edge and another, there was about one meter, uh, three feet for no metric of all of you. As, and uh, these uh, funny cards, extension cards, uh, are used to configure the board in the way you want. For example, you can have two or three external PCIs, you can have various kind of uh, network adapters. Uh, it was all used for development to uh, ease all testings and uh, providing various consistent configurations. Right now, uh, the Kavium made its final product. Uh, it's, uh, actually, it's a dual socket system. I mean, two Thunder X chips uh, connected through coherent interface with, between each other, uh, providing up to 96 cores uh, per uh, this board. And this is a standard form factor which is suitable for typical rack cases. And actually, it's already been used in data centers. So uh, this, is, this is a photo taken in our lab in SemiHealth. Uh, we just ripped off the board and, uh, from the working system and take a, shot the photo. Okay, back two years ago, uh, the FreeBSD was not really supporting MV8. Uh, thanks to Andrew Turner, uh, we, who did a lot of work uh, to provide uh, very basic support and all the platform support for FreeBSD on the simulator, uh, we had actually uh, the good baseline to start working with. Um, the simulator was quite nice. The, the QEMU and uh, I, I believe the um, foundation models uh, showed that the kernel and the world built um, on ARM V8 architecture was, was pretty decent. Um, all low-level stuff was done, uh, interrupts were working, PMAP was done. Uh, the only thing was known to be missing are, was where the uh, Kavium specific stuff. And by Kavium specific, I mean Thunder X drivers and the completely new approach to interrupt, uh, I mean Geek V3 and Interrupt PlayStation Service, ITS, which was uh, the first implemented by Kavium. 
So uh, we were very keen to start working with. Unfortunately, when we start uh, running the FreeBSD uh, on the actual hardware, a lot of uh, the strange things become to happen. Uh, first of all, we were fighting a lot of bugs. Um, the uh, system was definitely not considered stable and was crashing almost immediately. Uh, and we spent almost a year uh, trying to stabilize the system enough just to make it possible to uh, do some other stuff, like uh, drivers, for example. Uh, the source of these bugs was pretty obvious. Uh, we were the first guys who tried actually run the FreeBSD on the actual hardware. And uh, comparing to the simulator, uh, the uh, hardware was uh, really, uh, it has caches, it had pipelines, uh, it had some timings uh, issues. So all this stuff uh, was not correct. It was, it's impossible to actually to emulate these things in a simulator. Uh, so uh, this was mostly the issue which we were fighting with. Uh, they also, the early version of hardware were far away from being perfect. They had a lot of errata, a lot of things was not working, uh, but it's uh, really, uh, it was in really good shape, uh, regardless of these erratas. Uh, so, actually, this is what we, what we had done. Uh, by bugs, I mean uh, not the kind of bugs you probably all have seen on FreeBSD. Uh, if we had a comfort to have a panic, to have a system entering the KDB and the ability to, I don't know, uh, write some commands, spend two hours and say, oh, I found a bug. So, well, no, it was definitely not the case in, uh, in Thunder X. All of the bugs we encountered uh, were just like the system was running, 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 and in one of the moment of the time, it hanged. And it, hanged, it always was hanging in a very specific way because uh, there was impossible to even debug it further. Uh, so uh, we spent a lot of work uh, trying to analyze the stuff and to fix uh, all the issues which were in the base system. Uh, I will prepared a few, two examples to show uh, what bugs we were, were we dealing with. For example, this is a typical bug which we found on the early stage of the development. Uh, this is the part of uh, exception handler. Uh, actually, the end of exception handler. Uh, it is supposed to load, uh, restore link le register and SPSR from the stack and return from exception. Unfortunately, uh, when the uh, interrupt arrived just uh, before, between these two instructions, uh, it overwrite SPSR. When the SPSR was overwrite, uh, then we restored the wrong value and we're returning from exception with wrong PSR set and that resulted in a completely deadlock of the system. The interrupt were not working, the exceptions were not working, so, uh, well, <laughs> a black hole. Uh, we have spent two weeks analyzing this because it was just uh, very hard to find even uh, when we have uh, hardware debuggers uh, this situation was really hard to catch because uh, the timing is crucial in that case. But when we finally found this, uh, the uh, fix is quite funny. It's a one-liner. Uh, it was enough to uh, disable all interrupts in the exception handler, and the system started working. So uh, just as a precaution, we added looking interrupts in every other place uh, when the exception handler handled and just left it. Uh, the second one was also very interesting. I will not go to details right here, uh, but I will encourage all of you to enter in our community blog arm. Uh, we are providing some interesting stuff we had found during our V8 development. Uh, actually, this entry is about uh, the bug with stack, stack growth. I recommend you look all at this. It's quite, uh, it's quite interesting stuff, I think. Okay, so once we uh, finally stabilized the system enough to be able to actually run the development, uh, we had to implement several drivers. Uh, these drivers were actually quite big one uh, because uh, the uh, ARM uh, ThunderX was the first architecture which actually 
uh, implemented and supported the GIG v3, uh, the new version of Interrupt Controller. Um, the new version, as you can see, is definitely better than the previous one. Uh, it, the most, what is most interesting, it provides uh, a completely new implementation of affinity-based routing. Uh, previously, uh, the interrupts can, could be routed only to up to eight CPUs. Uh, right now, the uh, interrupt destination register is much wider, and that implies that we can address much more number of CPUs, um, like hundreds of them probably. Uh, also, adding ITS, I recall Interrupt Translation Service, uh, also provided, uh, added the possibility to create an immense number of interrupts. Uh, on the Thunder X, on, oh, sorry, on ARM V8, uh, it is possible to uh, create four billions of various interrupts. Uh, it's really, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm sure uh, that no one ever tries to allocate such, say, numbers of interrupts, um, but it's possible. Uh, on Thunder X, this value was artificially limited to 8,000, uh, but it's still a lot more uh, than uh, on ARMv7, which was maxing at about 200. Okay, so um, this is how the new Gig V3 in looks like internally. Uh, what we can see here, there are two parts. One part is marked using uh, blue arrows. This is the legacy part. Uh, this is it's very similar to the way how the Geek V2, I mean previous generation, worked. Uh, we had a distributor which uh, was offering a lot of interrupt lines. Each device, and by device I mean um, this legacy device in the middle, uh, each device was physically connected inside the chip with a wire, with a silicon wire, to a distributor. Uh, when the device wanted to trigger an interrupt, it uh, asserted that this line, and the distributor uh, know which device asserted this line. It converted this number of this line to ERQ number and uh, trans moved this, uh, notified uh, the appropriate CPU about the interrupt arrival. It was, uh, it was working very, very nicely for a lot of years, um, but if we had to increase the total number of interrupts, uh, it was pretty hard to be implemented inside the silicon. Uh, in normal, in typical RV7, distributor was able to handle about 200 interrupts. Uh, so adding uh, more interrupts to distributor was, well, was not a good idea because the space area uh, which was required inside the silicon would be too large and just the solution just would not scale at all. Uh, so. And this is why the interrupt translation service was developed. Uh, right now, the ITS is a completely new uh, sub-module of the Geek V3, which is mostly responsible for triggering message signal interrupts. Uh, I will talk about it later. So right now, uh, we uh, can memorize that Geek 3, the legacy part of Geek V3, uh, is responsible for all the same things that were used in the previous generation of interrupt controllers. I mean, it manages PPIs, SGIs, uh, it handles the legacy interrupts, and it sends IPIs to different CPUs based on the CPU affinity which we are setting. Okay, so, uh, but there is more. Uh, now we've got an ITS. Uh, let's say a typical example. Uh, right now, a lot of devices like PCIe devices left on left and on the right, let's assume that they are PCI devices, uh, are triggering interrupt using a message signaled interrupt method. Uh, it uh, works in the way that if the device wants to trigger an interrupt, it sends, uh, it triggers the memory transactions on the bus. The memory transactions contain two things, device ID, and the MSI ID, which is an internal interrupt number of the device which it wants to trigger. Uh, when the ITS snoops this translation on the bus, on this uh, operation on the bus, it knows uh, that this particular message is an interrupt trigger uh, from some device which is connected to. 
so having uh, known uh, this device ID and MSI ID, uh, the ITS is able to translate uh, these two numbers into uh, another number, which is actually the ERQ number, which is passed directly to the appropriate CPU. So that means we no longer have to need to have a physical wires inside the chip who, which travels, they interrupt the other cores, but we can do this using messages. So devices send uh, memory messages to ITS, and then ITS send a message to appropriate CPU, uh, which uh, allows us to utilize more uh, than more interrupts than we were able to use before, up to four billions, like it said in the specification. Um, the interrupt translation service required uh, creation a new class of IPI of uh, interrupts, LPIs, locality specific peripheral interrupts. They are basically MSIs in terminology of PCI. Uh, so uh, the ITS, uh, when uh, its main responsibility is to snoop for any trans transaction, PCI transaction, uh, which is actually the triggering of interrupt, and converting the MSI device ID and MSI ID to an appropriate ERQ number. This ERQ number is directly passed to the red distributor and by essence to the appropriate core. Um, the advantage of this approach are quite significant. Right now we have a standardized way to handle MSIs. Previously on ARM, every vendor created its own, his own uh, MSI controller. None of them were compatible between each other. So uh, there was a lot of drivers, a lot of stuff which we need to be taken into account. Uh, right now, if, ARM, if you have ARMv8 and it supports GKV3 and ITS, then you have, can be absolutely sure uh, that is a standard approach and FreeBSD will work on that. Um, it also allowed this whole system to increase the total number of MSIs, as I said before, up to four billion. Of course, there are some side effects of this approach. Having the uh, ITS means that we have very complex method of uh, configuring the interrupt. Uh, previously, we didn't have to worry about uh, which uh, interrupt pa maps to what interrupt number. Right now, everything is being able to be configured. Uh, so upon interrupt configuration, we need to map something called interrupt collection. It's the set of interrupts uh, which are mapped, which are tied to appropriate device. Then we need to allocate interrupt translation table inside the ITS, um, reserve range of, uh, range of LPIs, uh, I mean M MSI numbers, uh, which must be unique in the whole system, and then create a mapping uh, between device ID and MSI ID, and put this mapping into interrupt translation table. Uh, once all this is done, uh, we can use uh, MSIs uh, just like any other interrupt before. Um, this is a very simplified um, list of things that has to be done um, because the whole ITS code, I believe, is about 10,000 lines. So this device is really complex and understanding its internals took us a lot of time and effort. Having the ITS done uh, was the first step of providing support for ThunderX. Uh, the second was the PCI interface. Uh, ThunderX has a very interesting feature. It is, uh, the system is called uh, PCIe-centric. Uh, by this uh, term, I mean that every internal device which is present on ThunderX is uh, connected to the cores using PCI interface. Uh, that has some good points uh, that uh, we can detect these devices and enumerate them using a standardized PCI method. Uh, we no longer have, need to have uh, these devices inside DTS or ACPI tables uh, because they are enumerated uh, in the runtime uh, without necessity to analyze some crazy stuff like DTS. All components then can be reused in another revision and the single, uh, the single kernel uh, can just uh, load different modules uh, depending on what PCI devices it detects. Uh, also having the PCI devices on the tree implies that we can use MSI, I mean message signals, signals interrupts 
uh, for infra handling, which is quite useful in, in our in nowadays. Um, this is the slide how it looks internally. It's taken from marketing, so the numbers on the left are quite exaggerated. Uh, but the most uh, a uh, crucial part inside the, uh, the chip is a coherent fabric inside. It's the interconnect between uh, the whole bunch of CPUs, uh, the DDR controller, and the IO network. By the IO network, there should be an internal PCI controller, but they named it that way. Uh, this actually this is internal PCIe bus, which has a lot of devices present on them. I mean, MAC devices, SATA, uh, external PCI controller and all other stuff which are not listed on this photo. Um, the PCI was, was, very, was not very difficult to implement, uh, but the most crucial part of the Thunder X was its network capabilities. If the uh, chip was meant to compete with Intel, it had to have pretty decent uh, network interface. Um, KVM uh, decided to provide a very complex uh, Ethernet adapter, uh, which fortunately uh, was not a big blob of gates, but it was rather uh, divided into three um, major parts. Uh, the BGX is, was responsible for a packet. Uh, it's like a phi, typical phi. Uh, on the input, it uh, consumes an L2 packet, and on the output, it through the packet out or in through the copper or fiber interface. Uh, the network interest interface controller is actually the main part of the, uh, of the system, which actually is the network card and uh, do all the Ethernet stuff. Uh, the BG, BGX and NIC are connected using traffic network switch. Uh, this is a special device developed by Kavium. Uh, which is used mostly for packet shaping, for packet analysis, QoS, etc. Right now it's disabled. So it passes every packet uh, which, uh, every packet which enters the TNS appears on the other side, so no operations are done on this packet. This is how it looks on the picture. Uh, we have a NIC uh, which provides up to 128 virtual network adapters. Uh, each virtual network adapter is a separate network card connected to, sorry, connected to the switch. Mm. The switch uh, passes the packets in and out from network card to appropriate BGX. BGX is connected to the switch uh, using four uh, LMAC lanes. Each of this LMAC lane is capable of sustaining 10 gigabit of Ethernet traffic. So for example, if you want to have 40 gigs on BGX, uh, you need to utilize four LMAC lines. Uh, it's very flexible, you can configure it almost any uh, way you want. You can use, I don't know, 10, uh, sorry, uh, four 10 gig interfaces or two uh, 20 gig interfaces and all combinations are between. Uh, the BGX, as I said before, is mostly responsible for file management. Uh, it uh, traverse, traverses the packets which are going into, into BGX to, um, to the PHY and as the result to appropriate medium uh, which transport the packets to the network. Um, this one is interesting. Uh, when you power up the Thunder X and uh, call the PCI conf to see what PCI devices we have uh, in the system, you will see a NIC, a physical function, a single network device, which is actually not a network device. Uh, it's the first network card uh, that I know which does not offer network capabilities at all. Uh, it's only used uh, for resource management. Uh, when the user uh, wants to, uh, the user is, has ability to create and destroy network interfaces. Uh, if uh, you want to create a network interface, you just uh, you, you create a virtual function based on physical function using standardized SRIOV method. Uh, this virtual function is the uh, thing uh, which actually does uh, all network capabilities. Uh, the physical function is used only to management, to link polling, I don't know, to if you do if config up, 
the request when go to a physical function. So it's major responsibilities to manage all resources and initialize and kill a uh, virtual function. Uh, the virtual function is the core of the whole network the KVM offers. Um, it's made of uh, two things. And the first thing, uh, which is a part of virtual function, is a QSET. And the QSET is, uh, for those, all, I hope all of you are familiar with the internals of the network adapters and how they are working. Uh, the queues are used for packet transfers and to, use, and, to use, and to do DMA transfer between a network card and the system memory. Uh, each virtual function has up to eight receive queues, eight send queues, eight completion queues, and two receive buffer ring. ring. I will explain later uh, which one does what. Um, the next thing uh, the virtual function offers is a physical Mac, it's a network card. So uh, having the network card enabled and QSET enabled uh, makes the virtual function fully functional network adapter. But uh, what if uh, we have 48 cores? So what happens if we want to have uh, more than eight, uh, I don't know, more than eight cent queues uh, in the driver? It should be possible because if you've got uh, 48 cores, it is reasonable to assume that each core should have its own queue uh, just to use, better utilize cache and etc. So it is possible, of course. Uh, you can allocate another virtual function and um, join all of them together to create one big logical network adapter made of resources of all the virtual functions which are going into uh, this logical thing. Uh, for example, if you, had, if you want to have uh, 48 uh, receive queues, you need to allocate, if I count correctly, five uh, virtual functions and merge them into one. This is how it looks internally. Uh, let's just concentrate at the first on VF0. Uh, if we forget about the VF1, the VF0 is the complete network adapter. Uh, it has uh, such things as RBDR. Uh, RBDR is uh, uh, some kind of container. It's used uh, to store a free uh, receive embos. Uh, the card, uh, when it's initialized, it needs to be filled uh, with a set of free embos, which it can use to uh, store the data which it receives over the link. Uh, on the ThunderX VNIC, uh, we used an RBDR for this. And when the packet arrives on the receive queue, uh, then the receive queue takes the first free descriptor from RBDR and fills uh, the descriptor data with actual data received in the packet. Uh, when, it re when the receive completes, uh, the receive queue uh, sends a notification to the completion queue uh, that something has happened and, well, driver, you've got something in the completion queue, you can do what you want. And the driver gets an interrupt, uh, parses the completion queue request, uh, sees that, oh, some, somebody sent us a packet and it passes the packet up to the network stack. Uh, from the other side, if the network stack wants to send a packet, uh, it is uh, enqueued uh, to the send queue. The send queue then transmits uh, the packet over the link, and when the transmit completes, uh, it signals the completion, or the error, if the error occurs, to a completion queue. Then the driver can know that the packet would send, the both can be freed, and etc. Uh, in this case, uh, we also have uh, an ability to merge uh, several VFs to a single logical adapter. On this picture, uh, there is shown how to use actually uh, the completion queues, the receive queues and send queues from another VF, another queue set. Uh, as you can see, uh, the VNIC is disabled on the subsequent virtual function. That means that the only VF0 has the network capabilities and all subsequent VFs are used only as a bunches of resources. Uh, from the programmer perspective, it is possible to uh, use completion queue and RBDR uh, in many-to-one assignment mode. 
I mean uh, the receive queues, more than one receive queues can uh, steal the buffers from RBDR, or from single RBDR, and the completion queue can handle uh, more than, can handle requests from more than one receive or send queue. This is how it's uh, uh, picturized on here, on completion queue, sorry, on completion queue zero. So that, uh, the design of Vinic is quite complex, but actually it allows us to, uh, to con configure the network card exactly as you want. Uh, if you want a lot of send queues, you have it. You want a lot of receive queues, you have it. You can use DPDK on this even if you want. Um, just a matter of the application required. Yesterday, as you know, we've got a code freeze. Uh, so, uh, this time I'm happy to announce that finally the single socket support is upstream to the head and the head is working on single socket Thunder X without any issues. Uh, all IR interfaces are supported. Uh, the performance is quite good. Um, the system, I think, might be considered quite stable. Uh, we're recently, we're do doing a lot of uh, performance optimization work. I mean, from the beginning of the year, mostly what we were doing was the performance optimization, and uh, we did not see any kernel panic at all. So that's a good progress when you compare the situation from the one or two years ago. Of course, there are some things which are missing. Uh, still, the FreeBSD has very uh, serious issue with scalability. Uh, when we, uh, we don't see any performance improvement if we enable more than 20, 25 cores. Uh, so that means that the 96 version of Thunder X is pretty, pretty useless on, on FreeBSD. Uh, we also require some crypto support, uh, which was not developed yet. Um, the support for secondary interrupt translation service, uh, which was not developed yet, which is blocked by lack of interrupt NG. And it probably the, all of this uh, to-do stuff are targeted for FreeBSD 12.0. Uh, so maybe in one, two years, they will drastically improve. Um, I was mentioning before about performance. Um, and the Thunder X was meant to compete with Intel, as I said before. Uh, so uh, we did a lot of effort to provide such compatibility, uh, such performance, even similar to what uh, Intel server can offer. Uh, so this time I've prepared a set of tests. Uh, these tests are, some of them are synthetic, some of them are more realistic. Um, but let's start from the test first. Um, in this test, I would like to compare uh, two things. First of all, the Intel V uh, versus Thunder X, and the second, FreeBSD versus Linux. Uh, as a test, I chose Hyper 3 uh, with 40 GB uh, direct attached link. Um, the Intel was uh, run, were running with uh, Mellanox Connect X3, uh, while the Thunder X was using native Vinic. Uh, as a Intel CPU, we chose uh, the Intel E5-2603, uh, which is clocked uh, from 1.6 gigahertz, uh, because we believe uh, it offers similar per-core performance as Thunder X. So this is, this is the case why, they, why we chose such slow uh, CPU to, to run the test on. Uh, I will say what I expected. I expected the FreeBSD ARM V8 would be the worst, but it's not. The situation is quite interesting. Uh, the best what we get uh, is the Linux Intel. It's quite expected because um, Linux has a lot of, uh, recently it's done a lot of work to improve network performance. And uh, the Linux uh, with Mellanox card was easily able to uh, achieve up to 38 gigabits per second. Um, but what is really interesting that the FreeBSD running on Intel using the same card uh, was struggling uh, doing 10 gigs. Uh, so Thunder X is just in the middle. Uh, we are starting, uh, before we did all optimization, we are starting 
uh, above the level of FreeBSD Intel. Uh, but doing, after doing all of uh, the stuff like RSS, like uh, interrupt affinities, thread affinities inside the driver, uh, we are now able to achieve 30 gigs of continuous network traffic. Uh, we do have uh, the limitation uh, which we are facing now is heavily locking inside the TCP stack. We've got some detraces collected. We probably share uh, findings on the FreeBSD delete, but it's still too early uh, to do so. So right now I'm only pointing out that probably is the case. Uh, the second test we did uh, was, it's more meaningful one. Uh, we used Nginx uh, to serve memory-backed files using HTTP. Uh, we measured throughput versus number of Nginx threads. And this time, uh, the only comparison we did was benchmarking uh, StandardX FreeBSD versus StandardX Linux. The case was sta stated that the Linux version is the state of the art and it worked like a charm. So this was the, quite a good reference uh, to compare. Uh, this is what we got. Uh, the Linux, of course, it's, it's quite, quite decent. Uh, but the FreeBSD is, uh, I, I was expecting that the FreeBSD would be worse, actually, but uh, it's, it does the job. Uh, still, it has some issues. As you probably see, uh, we are trying to debug why uh, the curve looks how it does. So right now we've got a very little idea uh, why the, uh, the curve oscillates and why it isn't stable uh, across increasing number of threads. Probably it's because of uh, VM, poor VM support or, sorry, or, or something. Uh, but it's still uh, something which we need to confirm. Uh, the last test uh, is a synthetic one. Uh, I was trying to benchmark the SSD performance on the Thunder X. Uh, to do this, I used an FIO test uh, with three SSDs attached. I know from the <laughs> previous project I was doing that each of these drive is capable of achieving 50 a kilo operation per second uh, using 4K block size. Uh, so uh, we compared uh, Thunder X FreeBSD versus Linux. This is what we got. Uh, in this place, I would like to thanks, uh, thank you a lot, Warner Losh and John Baldwin, uh, for the work they did in re refactoring I.O. and refactoring CAM scheduler. Uh, because one month ago, before that work was integrated into the head, the performance, the uh, FreeBSD performance were really awful. And uh, FreeBSD was, with troubles, able to get 7,000 operations per second. Now, with all these changes integrated, it's pretty the same. It's a little bit worse than Linux, but it's mostly, uh, mostly matches between uh, both two systems. Uh, each line describes, uh, I'm going to describe the legend, uh, each line describes the number of threads, uh, concurrent threads per disks, uh, which are executed, and each set of two lines uh, is a test uh, on different number of CP of, of SSDs. So the lowest two lines uh, represents the test run on one SSD, then two SSDs, and then three SSDs. So uh, here we can see that the performance uh, scales almost linearly across uh, SSD number. Okay, you can, uh, at the end, I encourage all of you to look at uh, following links, uh, to follow our ARM community blog, and to follow our YouTube channel uh, where we put some interesting stuff regarding ARMv8. I uh, would also like to thank you all of guys uh, which were uh, engaged into the um, FreeBSD, into the ThunderX and ARMv8 project, uh, especially to Ed Master from FreeBSD Foundation, Andrew Turner, who did a lot of good work uh, in the baseboard, and all the Semihal team, uh, which uh, did the ThunderX uh, Thunder port. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer.
Yes, we're using the generic uh, version of the kernel. It uh, worked after we fixed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The question was uh, if we are using uh, generic kernel SRIOV for the Vinix stuff, and if it worked. Okay. Any others? Yeah. Uh, the question is about difference between SMMU and MMU. Uh, so the SMMU is used mostly for virtualization. It's uh, the equivalent on Intel IO MMU. It translates the DMA transactions onto the bus. Uh, so I suggest uh, Wiki because there is a um, very good explanation. What is it? It's equivalent of IO MMU. Yes? Yes, it is, it is VTD. The VTD is uh, uh, the question is if uh, it is similar to VTD and if the VTD is a step up from IOMMU. So the VTD requires IOMMU. IOMMU is only the uh, CPU feature which is required to uh, make the CPU VTD compliant, as I recall. Uh, it is used, uh, you know, it's used for PCI pass-through of devices to the VM, so you need to have the IMMU to make it working. Yeah. And was it the answer to? Okay. Yes. It is. Okay. We use only two. Uh, the question is if we are using all four uh, privilege levels in ARM. So no, we are using only the first two, zero and one. Actually, on Raspberry Pi, we are using also three, but it's just on the very, very early of boot. OK, so if there is uh, no more questions, uh, thank you, all of you, and have a nice day.